What is embroidery? It's very clear, it's a simple definition, it's work with a needle and thread upon cloth. The sort of work we've done over a number of years, some of the work we've done has used a cloth which is soluble. Uh, the traditional cloth for embroidery which is soluble is uh, acetate, which is dissolved in acetone, uh, but in recent years we've been using a lot, lot more of PVA, polyvinyl alcohol, which is just soluble in hot water. And if you design your embroidery properly, uh, it won't fall to pieces when you take away the base material. Uh, embroidery as a whole has been going for a very considerable number of years, um, but uh, I'm more interested in machine embroidery, uh, which has quite a lot of conventional applications, such as baseball hats. Uh, we have a, a company logo embroidered on the baseball hat, and we stand around in a circle before we start work every morning and sing the company's song <laughs> with our hats on. Um, of course, there's embroidered T-shirts, of which that's a considerable trade, and there are some fantastic T-shirts uh, uh, in exhibitions, particularly print wear and promotion, which is the, the big one. But um, liturgical garments are really the ones that are absolutely splendid, uh, much, most of which, of course, uh, over the centuries have been done with, uh, with hand embroidery. But the benefit of machine embroidery is that it is reproducible. You can make exactly the same uh, embroidery, or almost exactly the same embroidery, over and over and over again, which for engineering applications is important. You can place the needle on a, an embroidery machine to within a tenth of a millimeter. Because textiles are more mobile structures, that doesn't mean to say you have the precision of a tenth of a millimeter uh, placement uh, in the final object, but you have at least got a precision of the manufacturing technique. So, um, how do we? Um, how did we get involved in embroidery? By networking, and I had a friend who sold machine, uh, embroidery machines, and he told me that there was a firm in America, um, somewhere in um, Washington or California, who'd bought uh, several embroidery machines from uh, their American branch, uh, and they thought they were using them to make bits for airplanes for Boeing. They bought the machines, they never bought any spares, so we assume that that project faded out of the way. But there have been a number of other groups working on embroidery for engineering. There's been a long-standing group at Dresden uh, and also a group at Aachen. And more recently, uh, the Composites team at Bristol University uh, Aeronautics Department have uh, been doing some work, which we'll have a look at. But the obvious um, question was, what was in it for them and why were they using embroidery? And it is partly because of the precision and partly, the other thing is that because you can place a needle in any, two, two needles, two needle insertions in it, two stitches in any position, the fibres between them will run in any given direction. That you <coughs> can optimise the fibre architecture within the, within the, within the structure. But yes. so clearly, the answer, they were buying stuff for engineering, and with the University of Nottingham and uh, a few others, including Ford Motor Company, uh, particularly their offshoot at that time, Jaguar. And we developed uh, this project, which was known as MASET, which was the acronym for the manufacture of structural composites using embroidery techniques. So what is a composite? Uh, that's the, the definition of a composite. Uh, but why do you have textile composites? I yesterday made a bit of uh, just a piece of resin and uh, I may end up with a red face because all I want to do is to demonstrate that this resin is brittle but I've made it <laughs> <laughs> I've made it a bit too uh, too stiff but sometimes I, I've got a thinner piece that I've taken to schools and I have made a mess all over the floor <laughs> when it shatters and then I get embarrassed because uh, I've got to uh, I've got to clear up afterwards, but it's a, thank you, it's tough, which I will demonstrate in a minute. Yes, obviously textiles are soft and floppy, uh, the resins are hard, but if you combine the two, you get a very stiff, strong structure. So composites combine the best of textiles 
with the best of the resin properties. Uh, they're very tough, very tough. That's the uh, uh, a fairly standard definition of uh, a composite. The two items, or more items, retain their individual identities. They don't dissolve or merge, uh, but they act together to form the best of the two properties. Uh, and normally you can ex uh, show the properties clearly in these samples that I've brought with me, which you can have a look at afterwards. It's quite clear that you can see the textile structure within. So why embroidery? It's because, as I say, you can optimise the fibre architecture. If you do that, you can cut out the waste. For example, you don't have to make cutting holes if you want to make a hole in the, uh, in the structure. It simplifies the manufacturing process. Uh, I'll show you some examples later. And because a modern embroidery machine is computer controlled, you have this benefit of reproducibility. There are several different sorts of embroidery machine. Uh, there's a direct stitching machine, a very standard machine which you gain where you will use for embroidered baseball hats and t-shirts and put your name on your, uh, your coat or whatever else. Um, there's machines which wrap the fibre that you're stitching down and then, then stitch the wrapping down and then there's zigzag applique using zigzag stitching techniques. This is the, uh, this is the sort of machine, a Cornelli, which is uh, a computer add-on really to a, a, an embroidery machine that was invented about 1870. Uh, it's now lost quite a lot of favour. Uh, if you want to buy one, I know where there's somebody uh, wanting to get rid of one cheap. It was recommended by one of the embroidery manufacturers that we dropped it in the River Trent. Uh, but there's the, the stitching head and this wraps, uh, it wraps around the fibre. This, this particular example is, uh, is laying down carbon fibre. It wraps the carbon fibre with a polyester thread and then stitches the polyester thread down. Uh, that's the sort of technique with the main bundle is the big bit and you can see the wrapping and the stitching down thread uh, which stitches it onto the base material. Uh, the more modern technique which I, I prefer now because it's quicker, cheaper and easier although the machines are in my opinion a bit overpriced uh, is to zigzag stitch so you take the base fibre and you literally do a zigzag stitch either side to stitch it down to the base material. Um, this is just as you would do with an ordinary sewing machine, use a zigzag stitch and control the fabric underneath using computer controlled uh, frame to hold the embroidery and move around. And uh, so this is what they're exploiting at the, uh, uh, at the University of Bristol, they, they bought this machine and this uh, holds the fabric, uh, holds the yarn which they're stitching down, in this case glass, um, and this revolves round as, this, as the, it turns and makes this, uh, uh, this structure, that particular bobbin turns around the needle so that uh, it doesn't twist the yarn. Because for a composite, you want to keep the fibres making up that yarn as straight as possible. Uh, but the advantages of that, of, of conventional embroidery machines, however, using direct stitching, is that they do stitch directly, and the machines are cheaper. Um, you can buy a good quality commercial embroidery machine for now about £8,000, £10,000 for um, a, a, a larger scale one, and you can pay through your nose for large output um, 24 head embroidery machines, so they'll embroider 24 t-shirts or whatever at the same time, so they'll come up to about £50,000, £70,000. But for the sort of thing we have, <coughs> Uh, we're interested in a single small embroidery machine, a uh, £10,000 machine does quite a lot. When you compare it with a Jacquard loom which will cost about €300,000, it is quite a cheap option. Um, yeah, the disadvantage of direct stitching is that the reinforcement needs to go through the needle. Now that means it's got to turn about 340 degrees and with a lot of these fibres, particularly carbon fibre, the little filaments shatter because they're very stiff and strong, but, but because they're brittle, so that you break the fibres. And stitching carbon fibre uh, through a needle is not very easy. The alternative is to put it through the rotary sewing hook, uh, which goes underneath the machine, 
Um, but that rotary sewing hook is a finite size, holds a finite length of fibre, so you've got to keep stopping the machine to replace it, and then you get breaks in your reinforcing yarns. But here's a very conventional embroidery machine. This is a, uh, a £10,000 machine, which I was referring to. Um, there's, uh, this, this is a 12 colour machine, so it takes 12 needles. Uh, you can stitch 12 different colours at the same time if you want to. Uh, this is the moving part of the machine with the embroidery, the base fabric held in it, and this is all the gubbins that moves, the, uh, uh, moves it backwards and forwards. Fairly simple to use. Software uh, is anything from £1,000 to £5,000, um, but it's quite easy to use. Uh, even I can use it. Um, another view of it. There's a rotary sewing hook. Uh, which you're probably familiar with if I show you a picture of it. You might not oh, be familiar with the um, nomenclature, but that's the rotary sewing hook which takes the yarn underneath the sewing head. There's also robot stitching. Kinetic at Farnborough, I hope this will start. Oh, we've missed one, but not to worry. This shows uh, actually an embroidery of a surgical implant under a conventional machine uh, and it's quite a hypnotic process even if you've been running an embroidery machine for a very long time it's still quite splendid to see the pattern develop you can see here it's a bit confusing but the stitching head remains stationary and the fabric moves under the stitching head I have wasted hours watching the <laughs> <laughs> um, One of the things we did under this so-called Masset project was to reproduce a bearing housing. There, that's a press fit. Uh, a bearing fits in that space there. Because it was for an aerospace structure, these are weight cutouts, and uh, around the edge are where it bolts onto the frame of an aircraft. As you will have noticed, since most of you are designers, this is not a symmetrical structure. It's a complete pain in the bottom to design because it was uh, it got all these these holes were all you know just inconvenient places. However, it is not a three it's a three dimensional structure. You can see that's the, the cross-sectional photograph of that structure. And we used this as a demonstrator of our technology. Nottingham, where we come from, Nottinghamshire, I live now, uh, have done for many, many years, is famous for making holes, or for holes, selling holes, selling fresh air. Absolutely nothing is what we sell. We sell you holes, airspace, with, uh, uh, just held together by bits of thread in the lace trade. Uh, incidentally, though, you may be interested, there are some major exhibitions on lace going ahead for the next six months in Nottingham uh, at Nottingham Trent University and uh, collaboration with Nottingham Castle Museum. Just a plug for it. Um, however, so this was hole technology. What we're interested in is reinforcing holes, like you put a washer in, any, uh, in nearly any hole um, related to hole in any engineering to reinforce the hole. So here's our structure. Uh, here's the brains behind the business. Uh, my colleague Peter Butcher, here he is collecting his design medal from the uh, Textile Institute last year. This year's winner is Jimmy Chu, Paul Smith's another winner. So Peter has, I'm glad to say, been recognised for his very considerable skill as a uh, specialist in fine art, textile design and textile technology. Um, so this structure we wanted to reproduce and make it easier to make. It takes two and a half days to fill the mould for that bearing housing uh, if you make it by t conventional techniques, which is taking glass fabric, cutting it out, laying it in the mould. It's a very long process. We were able, using embroidery, to cut that process down to two and a half hours. Uh, what we did was embroider glass. This is, um, this is all glass yarn all around here on a glass base fabric. And uh, we made diff 19 different embroideries, all of different shapes, to make up 
that three-dimensional shape. Uh, and all you have to do was to cut out these, uh, these, su oops, these superfluous bits of fabric where the holes are uh, with a pair of scissors and pop them one after the other in selected order into the mould. Saved a lot of time and energy. And you may notice that where that fibres run in that direction where you needed that strength and stiffness and uh, around the holes we tended to try and, this was some of the early days of this work, to put some reinforcement around the holes. This wasn't the finest piece of work but we were still learning. This was a major research project. This, for example, is the fibre architecture for a seat belt reinforcement for motor cars. If you have a glass fibre base to your uh, car, uh, sports car perhaps, uh, you don't want the seat belt anchors to jerk out when the car stops very suddenly, so you need to reinforce it, spread the load over a wide area. So this is one way of uh, using the fibre architecture to spread the load. Uh, there's a, 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 another uh, seat belt anchor part, three quarters made. We made also a hub for a Jaguar Space Saver wheel. The Space Saver wheel on a Jaguar weighs 23 kilograms. The more weight you can save that you carry around with the car for the rest of its life, the better. It reduces carbon dioxide emissions and therefore these days it reduces the tax on your car. So they're quite keen to make it lighter. This was not an option. Uh, to make uh, a carbon fibre wheel for a Jaguar simply because it cost £900 to, uh, for in raw materials. But it was, again, a demonstrator project that uh, Jaguar and Ford were very keen to do. Uh, as you can see here, these fibres run primarily around, uh, circumferentially around the centre hole. But these fibres here run radially around the small hole. We then did another structure where an inter, inter, um, alternate interleaved them. Uh, and on this one, you see there's fibres run circumferentially around that hole and radially around the big hole. And there is a far very blurry photograph of the wheel hub of our Jaguar carbon fibre wheel. Uh, one of the problems of composite wheels, you will never get a composite wheel in a car because you can't see the damage. If you hit a curb hard and crack it, you won't see it. If you hit a car, a curb, or in my case, potholes, I've had a 150 pound bill for repairing my car wheels on potholes this summer, um, you can see the damage on a metal wheel. You can't see it on a composite wheel. So, subject to what I'm going to say in a bit, uh, you won't get a composite wheel. This is a gas turbine blisk, or gas turbine blade. This is for uh, the sort of thing you get in um, uh, aero engines and in uh, gas turbine engines. Uh, these, this is made with silicon carbide, two and a half thousand pounds uh, a kilogram. It's expensive stuff. And here is an embroidery made using uh, silicon carbide. And you can see, judging by all the filaments, that it's a very brittle fibre fibre and very difficult to handle. Racing cars. The, um, the component that somebody, here we are. There is the bit that saves the driver's life when that happens. That is the air intake for the engine, but it is also a rollover component. And that has to take a 12 tonne load in that direction. To save weight on a racing car, the, mac the minimum weight of a racing car is 300 kilograms of a Formula One car, but uh, the engineers want to save as much weight as they possibly can throughout the car, get it well under 300 kilograms, so the track engineer, the engineer at the race, can put ballast where he wants on the car most suited to that particular racetrack. But it has to take a 12 tonne load in that direction. If it doesn't, it won't pass the uh, tests before it starts the uh, season. And if you don't start the season and you're booked to start the season, the fines are enormous to uh, Mr. Eccleston's organisation. We're talking 
usually somewhere around $50, uh, 50, $50 million. Huge sums of money. So there's the embroidery. We took 16 layers of carbon fibre, uh, woven fabric, all with uh, resin on them, so they're all nice and sticky. Uh, you try stitching through sticky stuff, but I worked out how to do it. And through stitched that pattern. That is using uh, that, that's using um, that's using Kevlar in this case. Uh, no, uh, it's using a, a PBO fibre to through stitch it, um, and then it's cut out to make that shape, which forms the air intake entrance with all that load taking on it. The through stitching stops these 16 layers of carbon fibre breaking, uh, splitting apart when the load comes in that direction. It increased the impact resistance by just under 10%, which meant they could save weight by 10%, and every ounce you save, they will pay money for. Unfortunately, we made it nicely for two seasons, made a few bob on the side making these things, and then they discovered that it was banned under the rule book of Formula One. So we stopped making them, which is most sad. Uh, there we are through stitching uh, carbon fibre using again a conventional embroidery machine and we made a wing spar section that shape you can see where we put the stitches in along here and here to make that shape to make a wing spar this is the stiffener on an Airbus wing uh, that's the stitching process uh, it was quite a lengthy stitching of stitching it down here and stitching it along there to make that structure which stiffens the carbon fibre on the surface of the wing we, um, we did another project on uh, node and truss structures, so went down to Brooklyn's museum to have a look at the, uh, 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 the aircraft, the uh, Wellington bomber, which was under Loch Ness for 40 years, and this is the condition it emerged in, in excellent condition, nearly as good as new. We went to have a look at this with a number of um, colleagues we were collaborating with on this particular project, and this is Barnes Wallace geodetic structure. Um, Unfortunately, our life is uh, all boredom. It's work, 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 and we never have any fun doing anything. But, you know, that's the poor life of, a, of an engineer and textile man. Um, what we really wanted to do and what we were starting to work on was a whim rib cross-section. This is the, the bit that forms the shape of the wing, um, and there are 39 ribs like this all of different sizes down an Airbus A330 uh, on each side. So you'd need to make a lot of these. But this was the sort of shape we were looking at making uh, in a collaborative program with a number of companies. Uh, this is one of the embroideries we did towards that shape. Um, and this is just to develop new technology for um, ultimately for aircraft of the future. They're nowhere near making uh, wing ribs out of carbon fibre this way yet. Uh, it's at least a 10 to 20 year process. It's a very, very long process. I think you like to be safe when you're on an aeroplane and be confident. And so do the manufacturers and so do the airlines. So they take these things very carefully. We made a stealth door handle for uh, Kinetic. That's the um, uh, defence research base down at Farnborough. Uh, and we made a stealthy door handle for a ship because if you wish to creep up on people like pirates, for example, who have taken over somebody else's uh, uh, tanker, you don't want them to know you're coming. Uh, any sort of bandit you don't want to know. So these, this was a handle that was made in glass, which was not radar reflective, and it's currently sitting on a nice ship door demonstrator at Farnborough. And that is the shape we embroidered. Uh, Peter and I always say, if you can draw it, we can make it. So there's the shape, and it folds up to make that door handle. Uh, that's in a, a version in glass. I've also brought with me some samples of it in Kevlar. Um, now, will this one work? No, it doesn't. No, it's not going to pick it up. Uh, and then we started putting in um, sensors. I mentioned that you can't demonstrate that a uh, car wheel uh, is damaged. Similarly, you can't demonstrate that a, an aeroplane fuselage has been damaged by all those vehicles which come and service it. 
So we've worked with this uh, group of people, um, BVT, the shipbuilders, uh, down at um, Portishead. No, the other place, um, down Southampton Way. Uh, Sigma Techs are weavers, deep sea engineering were literally the, the uh, engineers, and Kinetic are this defence establishment. And we looked at put building sensors into carbon fibre and other structures. And uh, again, we wanted a structural health, it's called structural health monitoring, that's the, the trendy expression, but just putting sensors in. And our demonstrator project was a bridge. And we had a bridge uh, which the idea of this fairly small bridge, three metres long, was to put sensors in it so you could tell what load the bridge was carrying. And we realised that uh, not only could you tell the difference between an American and a British person by judging their weight, but also if you dropped a 50 pence piece on it, you could tell uh, where it had hit and how it had hit, just by embroidering in or weaving in sensors. This was not a, a yet another project. Most of the projects um, these days seem to come out at about a million pounds. Uh, it's not cheap. <coughs> we, we had problems, uh, although we could embroider the, en the uh, sensors in quite easily, it was uh, exiting the wiring from the composite. We had the difficulty with the electrical connections, insulating the sensors, making sure that these sensors, which are very, very narrow, they're only just over a millimetre wide and very, very thin, uh, that they didn't weaken the structure. Uh, connections were a problem. They needed to be robust. But the biggest problem I found was that some of them were so small we lost them in the structure. We made, spent beautiful hours making this lovely structure, marking each end very carefully with sticky tape, and then transport from our place down to uh, Farnborough. The sticky tape fell off, and we had to make them all over again. Uh, so we. we in all these things, it's important to be production focused. Um, you've got to think about mass, mass production. Uh, you've got to think about the application it's going to and uh, the whole process of simplifying production. Um, and here, this is a, uh, uh, some of the um, sensor being t tufted in uh, on the big robot that I couldn't show you because the video didn't work at, uh, at Farnborough. Uh, and there's all sorts of video applica uh, uh, practical applications. Um, yeah, come on, I hope this one's going to run. It didn't. Lifeboats, lifeboats, of course, go out when you come in. If you're a sailor, you come in, the lifeboats go out. They need to be terribly robust. They need to know when they've been damaged against rocks, against uh, other ships. Uh, and so on and so forth. So structural health monitoring of lifeboats is important. This is the fastest boat in the world. Nobody will tell you how fast it's going, but it goes very, very fast indeed. And I've seen ships, I've seen, oh, not ships, boats seized by customs and excise that will do 70 knots, uh, drug runners, and these will outrun any drug runner doing 70 knots. That is a hell of a speed. Uh, you can see that a, a, a boat like this gets a hell of a battering when it goes really fast. So you need to know how much damage is being done to it. I mentioned damage to aircraft fuselages. This is a bit of an extreme case. I think the owners knew when this was damaged. But you don't know if it's hit by a service truck because there's a service truck going to... Um, uh, if it's metal, you see, a service truck will bend it. If it's carbon fibre, the bend won't show, the damage won't show, so you need to monitor it continuously. Because is the service truck driver going to confess he drove a little bit too hard and too fast into your aeroplane? No. Yachts. There's a lot of money in high performance yachting, so you can put sensors into the sails, uh, into deep sea vessels. These things cost a quarter of a million pound to put to the bottom of the ocean, a quarter of a million pound to bring up again, so you've got to really get on with. Uh, making sure that uh, they're made right in the first place and you monitor them carefully. So that's why we put monitors in. You can even monitor wind turbines. Again, uh, oh, that's a ship. Uh, I'm trying to ship uh, an aeroplane in battle damage. But you need to know when defence equipment's been, uh, been damaged with subtle, more subtle damage. And um, also things like wind turbine blades when they've had serious bird strikes. Um, but structural health monitoring is important for composites, and it's, uh, if you can lay them in with embroidery, it's a quick, easy, and simple technique. 
So, surgical implants. How did we get into surgical implants? Uh, I was involved in the 80s with the developing what was called the Leeds KO artificial ligament for knee repairs, so the, the cruciate ligaments of the knees, and we got into embroidery with a problem. I was involved in the developing of the Leeds KO ligament. This is a woven structure with pockets. Uh, it's a, a Moclino fabric for anybody who's a, a weaver. This is something you learn about in college, but nobody ever, uh, hardly anybody ever uses them. Um, it's one of those sort of things. A Moclino tape with holes in. Uh, what, we, what we did, uh, what, what you do, you take a, an annulus of bone out using a cutter. Uh, that's, the, um, that's the thigh bone and that's the uh, tibia, the lower part of the uh, leg. Uh, take an annulus of bone and a bone plug out. You keep the bone plug, you take your black and decker and you draw right through to the middle of the knee. Um, and then you, so you get a bone tunnel like that. You repeat it on the other side. You pull, the, uh, you pull your artificial ligament through, the bone plugs go, one bone plug goes in that pocket there, the other bone plug goes in the area there, and schematically you end up with that. And you've got bone plugs there, in the side there, and the bone grows through the, uh, the hole in the mesh there and there, and anchors it into place, and across there you've got a scaffold for new ligament to grow. Uh, there's 120,000 people walking around with one of those inside them, but there were lots of problems because it takes weeks for that bone to regrow. So you've got to put your patient in, in, in crutches, basically, for several months, and they don't like it. So how do you screw that into place? How do you fit it? Staples, we, we use staples, but it's not an ideal solution. And with a woven fabric, if you, pull it, if you put a screw through a woven fabric, it tends to pull apart. And so there was this, this problem, how do you make an implant which would take a screw? And eventually, because I'm not a very bright bear, uh, eventually the, 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 the penny dropped. We'd done all this work on, on engineering embroidery and the penny hadn't dropped that you embroider it. You'd do exactly the same technique. So we went back to this whole trick of Nottingham, making holes again. So there, for example, is an embroidered shoulder implant. Uh, several varieties. Uh, this this there's another one here, for example. There's it fits through the whole of a modular artificial shoulder, and the rest of the artificial shoulder fits into one place. And then the three wings of this fit to the three wings of the rotator cuff uh, construction around the top of your shoulder. Rotator cuff, in a nutshell, stops your arm from dislocating when you lift it above. Oh, sorry, it's my microphone. I hope you've been able to hear me at the back. Shouldn't wave my arms around like a television presenter, should I? Uh, this is a bone repair for soft bones. Uh, and that is the one that's, uh, that was in the Power of Making exhibition. It was in the, uh, um, the Cooper Hewitt's Extreme Textiles and seems to be popping up in textbooks and people keep asking for it for their museums because it's beautiful and functional. So what was it for? This was for a patient who had had a uh, tumour removed from his shoulder two years previously and the surgeon wanted to go back in and reconstruct his shoulder so he wanted something again which would fit round an artificial shoulder, the hole in the middle goes into the artificial shoulder, but he wanted something that would um, stitch or screw to any tissue that he could find thereafter. Uh, but so he could just help rebuild it. He just wanted an all singing, all dancing implant. Uh, the screw holes need to be, needed to be marked out in, uh, in blue suture thread. This, all our surgical implants are made with suture thread because surgeons don't really understand textiles and they say, oh, don't like polyester, <sighs> don't like Dacron, no, don't like that. But if you say, oh, well, I've made it out of suture thread, you see they will, uh, they will turn around and say, oh, well, you know, that's all right, because I use that every day, it must be safe. It's exactly the same stuff, but uh, <laughs> it's just <laughs> braided together. Um, so you need, we, need, we use uh, green uh, suture thread to pick out the holes, because when they're all covered in blood, it can be a bit messy. But yes, we were quite pleased with the fuss that it's made. Uh, people have liked it because... It's, uh, it, it looks beautiful. This was Time Magazine's Most Amazing Inventions of 2006, I think it was. But um, uh, uh, we've sold two of them. 
because it's not a very common <laughs> it's not a very common operation. Uh, uh, but, but we were quite pleased in uh, in New York to walk down uh, Fifth Avenue and find this poster for the exhibition, which was uh, uh, bigger than Peter. Uh, so there's one of our implants uh, tied around an artificial shoulder, a different design of artificial shoulder. This was a, um, halfway through a uh, reconstruction of the humerus of a patient who'd had to have his whole humerus taken out and replaced his upper arm. I assure you it is most surreal to see somebody without a, um, uh, without a bone in their upper arm. Uh, that's the stitching, you've seen that one. Um, and this is a, a liner for an artificial artery. Uh, the, this is constructed with uh, super elastic memory wire embroidered onto a base fabric. Uh, it's embroidered in such a way that even if you twist it like a pig's tail, it, it doesn't close the lumen. It, this is uh, somebody else's device which leaks here. If it leaks, the patient dies. We made a device that, uh, that won't leak when you line it. Um, I'd better zoom on very quickly. Uh, we did a world's first clavicle replacement. You don't boast, uh, here we are, we, we, we put a, um, this was a braided structure that made by somebody else, and we had a device, a fancy shape, specially made for this one patient, which went through a hole in his sternum and around the first rib to hold the clavicle in place, because you've got to be able to move your arm there for it's got to be highly flexible. This was the world first. You don't brag about world first till you know they've been a success. Our fir world's first embroidery implant, it was a miner from Mansfield. Uh, the day after his operation, he got an aeroplane splint, he walked into a door, damaged his, uh, hurt his arm. Uh, he had to have it x-rayed. He sat down at the x-ray machine. He stood up, cracked his head, and nearly knocked himself unconscious. Uh, three months later, a dog jumped up at him, wrecked his shoulder completely, and he had to have a complete new shoulder reconstruction. Um, this is our spinal implant for the cervical spine of the neck. Again, embroidered. It's a quick operation to replace the discs in the neck. Uh, quick operation. So where's the future lie? Oh. <laughs> Right, oh, the future lies, uh, we've devised a method for, um, I don't know where that came, we've devised a method for um, laying down fibres of different types so that you can have one fibre, for example, will generate, will encourage the development of new muscle, another one fibre in the structure will, lay, will uh, encourage blood vessels to grow, another one will encourage nerves to grow. Uh, you can embroider those all into, for example, an artificial muscle shape, uh, build up a three-dimensional shape, put it into a bioreactor with some of the um, patient's uh, fat cells, react it, develop it into a, bus a full new muscle in a bioreactor, and then implant the muscle wherever they need it. That's where the future lies. It's very exciting. One day, some of these things may come to fruition. Thank you.